Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a seventh grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color is our schools. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity of every student. Welcome to our free online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series eight years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is about accessing a remote legislative session. These past two Washington state legislative sessions have been historic. For the first time, the legislative process was conducted in a virtual format where committee meetings and public testimony were held on Zoom instead of in person. In this webinar, we will discuss how the virtual legislative format impacts the ability of advocates to have their voices heard, know what conversations are happening in Olympia, and have the ability to pass thoughtful policies for students, and how the legislative process could be improved moving forward. Now I will ask panelists to introduce yourselves, and I'm going to call on, on one of you. I think I'll start with uh, Carissa because we like to put students first, and Carissa, feel free to call on other folks, and we'll just kind of go around the virtual room here. So Carissa, if you could start, uh, please introduce yourself. Perfect. Um, I am Carissa Crum. I'm Director of Community Outreach for the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council, and I am also our Chair of our Rural Engagement Task Force that we started this year. Um, I'm a senior at Hoquiam High School, but I attend full-time running start at Grace Harbor College. Um, let's take a little bit about me. Um, I'll call on Jasmine. Hello, everyone. I'm Jasmine Schmidt, and I'm an early achievers coach with a com community-minded enterprise and child care aware of Eastern Washington. I'm also the Washington Communities for Children Southeast Policy and Advocacy Lead, as well as Equity Lead. And I've been in early learning field for about 12 years now. And with that, I'm gonna call on uh, Tariq. My name is Tariq Scott. I'm a uh, legislative associate with the League of Education Voters. And I am going to pass it over to Karen. I am Karen Pillar. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Teen Child, which is a legal services office for young people. And I will pass it to Jean. Jean, Janae. It's Jenna. Thank you, Karen. Jenna Ray. I'm the Associate Director of the Zone at Northeast Community Center in Spokane, Washington. We are a collective impact initiative founded on the Children's Harlem Zone. So um, two gen of backbone support um, in a place-based initiative. We are members of the Cradle to Career Advocacy Group statewide with other backbone organizations. My past includes 20 years of being a classroom teacher in public schools and also a lobbyist in Olympia working on education and workforce initiatives. I'm going to call on Misha. 
everyone. Nice to be here. Um, Misha Wershkel, I use she and her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the Washington State Budget and Policy Center. We're a statewide uh, research and policy organization um, working on a range of different policy areas and a particular focus on the state budget as a tool to promote community well-being. Um, and I'm also the parent of a kindergartner at Hawthorne Elementary in South Seattle. Um, and um, I will hand it over to Daria. Hi folks, um, uh, my name is Daria Farvar. I'm the Public Policy Director at Disability Rights Washington. I use she, they pronouns, Happy Trans Day of Disability. Um, I am a woman with black hair and olive skin sitting with a gray sweater in front of a white background. So happy to be here, thanks for having me. And then uh, is it uh, Jennifer, are you the next one? Great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Bereskin, and I am a mother to a child with special needs. And we, um, I also do a lot of advocacy work as a resident action project member. And I was part of the committee that formed um, the poverty reduction work group to dismantle poverty in our state. And I'm just happy to be here and just to, to be able to share this space with you all. Thank you. Great, and thank you all for introducing yourselves. We're also going to hear some pre-recorded remarks from Kara Bailey, who is a parent advocate in Vancouver. To begin today's webinar, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral and unceded traditional lands of the 29 federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes in Washington state, including the Chehalis, Chinook, Colville, Cowlitz, Ho, Jamestown Sklallam, Kalispell, Lower Elwha Clallam, Lummi, Macaw, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Nooksack, Port Gamble Sklallam, Puyallup, Quileut, Quinault, Samish, Sauk Seattle, Shoalwater Bay, Skokomish, Snoqualmie, Spokane, Squaxin Island, Stilaguamish, Suquamish, Swinomish, Tulalip, Upper Skagit, and Yakima. We give thanks to elders both past and present, our native and indigenous colleagues, and the land itself. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. If time permits, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome, Carissa, Daria, Jasmine, Jenna, Jennifer, Karen, Misha, and Tariq. We're going to ask a couple of questions of the panel. The first one is, what was your experience in this remote legislative session? Was it more or less accessible than in a, a normal year? And then we'll ask, what will make the legislative process more accessible and more equitable moving forward? And so uh, with that, I'd like to start with Carissa. And uh, Carissa, feel free to share your experiences as a student advocate with the Legislative Youth Advisory Council and some of the other hats you wear. And then feel free to jump in other panelists as you feel moved. Perfect. So um, this session and last session were definitely the most accessible it's ever been for me. Um, I live in Hoquiam, which is only about an hour from Olympia, but especially with gas prices right now, that drive is just not possible. Um, and I also work part-time to almost full-time hours as a student. So having the time to take off work, to go up to Olympia to testify or to lobby was just not in the cards for me. And this online remote version was just so much easier. Um, I joined LIAC in the middle of COVID, probably a couple months after COVID had hit. So I was already under the impression that all the work I was doing was gonna be online. And I saw how that not only helped me, but also helped my colleagues that I work with who are in the Spokane area, who are in the Tri-Cities area, who are in Ridgefield, who are all over and how it's so much easier for them to access these resources and how much, how many more students we were able to reach because of this online format, because now so many people were used to Zoom calls and checking their email box every day. Um, so I would definitely say that this whole online thing, as crazy as it was, it was very accessible. And I remember I was testifying on a Senate bill that ended up passing to get 
the two state or two students on the state board of education voting rights. Um, I was testifying on them and I just gone off work. I had 15 minutes to get to my house. It's a 15 minute drive. And I ran up the stairs, whipped open my computer and I was on the Zoom call ready to go. I didn't have to make any drive to Olympia to the Capitol. I didn't have to try and find parking, which we all know at the Capitol is impossible. So I think it just all around made it a lot easier for students. And I know the students that I'm surrounded with, especially ones that even aren't on the youth council, just in Hoquiam or Oakville or Rochester, they were getting more engaged in not only their community, but in the state legislature through these online formats. So I will pass it on. I'll just add in from a regional perspective in Spokane, it really is an equity issue. And when I was in Olympia working on statewide issues, I remember trying to get people willing to come and testify and really having a geographical boundary of probably Yakima as the very furthest, because otherwise you're looking at having to spend the night somewhere, missing out on work or school. And so that's not an equitable voice. It doesn't represent what's happening in the Eastern part of the state. And what I've noticed over the last couple of years is that people for the first time are understanding how to engage and that they actually have influence in what happens at a statewide level. There's an assumption that um, nobody listens, hears, or understands Eastern Washington. And um, we're able to break down that assumption now because we can figure out how to testify, um, we can organize, and um, we can be informed. Uh, one of the other real huge benefits of going remote is the ability to sign in pro or con before the actual day of a hearing. Before when it was in person, you had to on campus sign in pro or con. So even if you didn't wanna testify in order for your opinion to be shared, you had to be there physically in person. And now we're able to, even ahead of time, spread that word and have um, much more grassroots contribution. So even if it would be overwhelming or intimidating, or if your work schedule wouldn't work with, with testifying at 11 a.m. on some weekday, you can still be involved and that increases the engagement of, of this perspective over here in Eastern Washington. So we've really appreciated it. I will piggyback off of uh, what Jenna said and just say, you know, we really saw folks showing up um, and doing grassroots advocacy in a big way when it came to a lot of the police accountability legislation this year as well. This was an absolute game changer for marginalized communities to be able to actually participate in the legislative process for uh, one of those policing bills alone. I think there were 2,500 people who signed in to share their position who otherwise would have been silenced and not be able to weigh in on critical legislation that is going to impact our communities in unfortunately a negative way. But um, we're going to talk about education, so I won't go down that rabbit hole too long. Um, uh, the remote legislative process has been an in incredible uh, way to just start mobilizing folks and get folks involved also in the disability community. Um, when we're talking about transportation to Olympia, we're talking about, you know, caregiving responsibilities, those um, challenges and barriers are even more amplified when we're looking at folks with disabilities who are trying to find maybe wheelchair accessible ways to get down to Olympia and get to a hearing room, or folks who are taking care of, you know, their loved one who has a disability, or maybe the individual with a disability is trying to get down to Olympia and needs to bring their caregiver with them, right? And the impacts of them having to leave for a day to support that individual as well are huge. Um, after the last legislative session, our first virtual session, I think things have uh, gotten a little bit smoother, which has been really great. We've also seen the legislature really um, come up with some small ways that they're trying to continue to improve accessibility, which has been really wonderful. Um, we had a huge showing after last session of folks showing up in support and saying we have to keep this system. Um, GRW and the Lincoln Housing Alliance and Mockingbird pulled together a petition and we were able to get a thousand individuals to sign on to it and 200 organizations and I think that speaks volumes to how much this was needed and, and why we need to continue it. Um, I think 
you know, I, I also have to highlight that um, for some folks, it wasn't more accessible. We still have an issue of, of uh, folks getting access to the technology they need to be able to participate. We need to have public broadband so folks can have access to the internet to participate. There are still some huge barriers there. Um, and it does seem like we are really moving towards a um, hybrid model in future years of having some folks in person, having some folks online. And I think it's gonna be really critical as we move towards that model that we really think about um, how to level the playing field between community advocates and lobbyists in particular. You know, I'm a lobbyist and I benefit greatly from being someone who understands how to navigate that process. And when I'm in person, I kind of, I know the channels and I know I can show up at a legislator's door and walk them to a meeting and try and get my viewpoints in there in ways that family members might not have had access to. So in some ways, having an online uh, um, session also leveled the playing field in that way. They had to answer my phone calls. They had to respond to my emails in the same way that they had to do that for community members. I wasn't there to show up in their face and to have those uh, channels and send notes on the floor, right? It was a very different game changer. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really curious to see how we do this in the future. I think we really need to be doing it with um, accessibility and equity and inclusion in mind from the very get-go as we're planning what a hybrid session looks like. So, yeah. I'd just like to piggyback off of what she's saying. You know, we do have coming from, you know, I'm an indigenous woman and we have a lot of our relatives um, who are out in these rural areas who don't have access to good, to good strong broadband. Um, I've, I've been able to testify in the legislature, you know, both in person and then when we first, then when we first started having COVID, we had to shift into the online model, uh, which was helpful for me being a person who's an immune compromised individual, but also having a child with disability, you know, being able to travel to the, to the capital meant that, you know, oftentimes I needed support from either the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance or other organizations like Community Change that were supporting us being able to go down and advocate um, either for housing justice or, or other um, supports that we were doing. I do think moving towards a, a hybrid model, but ensuring you know, those other barriers where if you are low income or if you don't have access to strong internet, that, um, that all people be able to provide some way of being able to contribute. Um, I feel like prior to the virtual model, you know, it was a privilege to be able to go down to the state capitol and to be able to testify when actually that is every person's right. Every person has the right to be able to speak to their legislator, to speak to any members of the Senate, Congress, House, anybody in terms of what it means to support what's going on in their community and to how they can better understand how to serve all of their constituents. And I know that um, having, having, having the ability to, to speak to my legislators has been able to create statewide change. Um, I recently had advocated on the SB uh, 5749, which was to support um, eliminating that fee if you didn't have a bank account to pay your rent. And while I was, it was just me and, and Michelle who spoke um, from Washington Low Income Housing Alliance that had a huge impact and that was able to, to pass. So I think it's really important that our most vulnerable communities are able to be able to speak to their, to their legislators without barriers um, and, and recognize that it does take a lot um, for us to be able to be down there and to be able to say, this is what we need um, as a community. So I thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, Jasmine? Oh yeah, um, I was just gonna piggyback what Jennifer um, said. Um, I, I think my experience in 2020 prior to COVID, um, we were going, we, we plan, when we were planning to go to Olympia for, uh, during legislative session, uh, it was heartbreaking for us to, that we had like five um, 
providers that wanted to go with us, but because of funding, we can only take two. And so um, com compare that with this legislative session, it was, um, it was, it was definitely a huge success um, for us to have remotely and virtual. Um, we were able to bring constituents, uh, providers and parents talk with legislators and really advocating for all the uh, budget as, especially for this legislative session because this is the amendment. So it was really important. And we brought our legislate, we connected legislators and constituents talk about all the uh, different areas that we have advocated. So that has been a huge success, I think. And um, just like what Jennifer said, it's, it's, I think it is a right that there are barriers. And I think this really addresses that, the accessibility and barriers. So. Uh, yeah. For me, I think there were some positives of virtuals along with the negatives. Uh, definitely um, the uh, positives, you know, what a lot of folks said was that um, it seemed to be like a community voices were really uh, centered at the table. When you look at uh, HB 1834, it's a concerning student excuse absences for mental health. Uh, around that bill, you had a student advisory group and then also a House Bill 1153, that's a language access bill. You had a, uh, there was a community advisory board. And so it was for me as a, you know, my part of my role at uh, here at uh, uh, Lev is, you know, I'm a le legislative associate, but I was also like our in-house lobbyist working with uh, external lobbyists. And so for me on the lobbying side, I'd say like the negative for me was that it didn't really allow for relationship building, which is like a key part of being a lobbyist. Uh, I was lucky we have an awesome external lobbyist, uh, Carrie Morris. And so she's has a lot of, she's has a lot of experience. So I was able just to like pick her brain more and just follow her lead per se. So I, uh, another plus was being able to like work with her. But for me being uh, new in this role, I definitely, uh, just from uh, previous experience in like 2020, right before COVID happened, I remember being down in Olympia. I had, I had, I had to be down there to share, share information and tell the folks in, in our coalition. Yep, it was with Misha at the time, actually. But I was in Olympia like in like fe January and February. I, I live in Seattle, so I was fortunate enough. And I have friends that were working in the, in the legislature. So I got to stay with them and I was lucky. But I, I had to be in Olympia to like, Inf share information and you know i i did still really novice really novice back then but just sitting by the chamber doors just like picking other lobbyists uh their brains just you know i had friends that were uh, were legislators so i got the chance to like talk to them on their staff and just being down there for me in 2020 right before covid happened i learned a lot it, it was awesome uh you know being a coffee shop just being around it for me, I think was like key. And I, I remember uh, um, the legislators on Wednesdays and their staff, they played basketball. And I got invited to play basketball with them. Then I was able to build like relationships with some of like the um, like Republican staff members, uh, Democrat staff members. It didn't really matter, you know, at the time, but I was just, that was a way for me, I think to break ice and build relationships. And I kind of missed that. And so, but at the same time, I do understand like, the, uh, you know, it made it made it way easier for community constituents to testify on bills, really be a part of like that process. And so that part I think is very positive. And so kind of what uh, we'll hope that it maybe can go to like a hybrid or you know, we've seen the positives and you know, for folks like myself in the lobbying space, uh, that relationship building is like real key. So just hoping safe safely, uh well, it'd be interested to see if we do go into like a, a hybrid model for the next legislative session. Yeah, thanks, Tariq. Uh, Karen, uh, Misha, anything you'd like to share about your experience? Oh, I'd be happy to add uh, everything that people have said is really on point. Um, I would maybe just um, share out. I, I've had experiences trying to help young people and their families come to Olympia to testify prior to the remote access and you know the logistics of coordinating rides and transportation and the childcare and the timing. Uh, online really changes that. But our experience at Teen Child since the pandemic is that there have been 
a different level of need, but, but the support to help people access online. It's sort of similar, right? The coordinating of a drive and where I'm gonna pick you up and you know, are you coming from Yakima and how long and getting lunch and like those things are a set of coordination, but we've, we've had a lot of challenges coordinating you know, do you have access to the internet? What kind of technology do you have? Do you understand how to use it? Um, and supporting them remotely, right? You know, I'm not a, I'm not a tech um, technician, you know, like, to, but I'm trying to remotely support someone else remotely, you know, accessing um, technology. Um, so I think, I think we need to be thoughtful about both those things. Um, so as we continue to have remote, I think we should continue to have remote access, but then figuring out like other people have said, how to make sure both our, our public structure, broadband and um, stuff is available, but also just the tools, you know, computers, phones, and the things that actually work for people and, um, and maybe opportunities for people to have access if they don't have all those tools. But so I think there is some more thinking about that. Um, and then related to that, maybe, maybe there'll be a follow-up where I can say more about this, but just how the state maintains information about the session it needs drastic improvement if we want more community engagement, right? So I'm a person who has lived a long time and has gone to a lot of education. I got a law degree. It was really hard to find the information that I wanted on the state's, you know, which bill, what, what was happening today, the schedule, the agenda, like I found the interface not that great. And so I think there's, there's a lot of room for improvement as we want people to act, you know, engage more community and have more accessibility. What transparency really means um, might require the state to update um, the way you can interface remotely with um, the information that's out there, which committee, who's on the committee, you know, all that stuff is, is a little clunky, I would just say. Um, and I think then the, the last thing is this idea of hybrid is really interesting to me. And I'm not sure that I feel one way or the other about it, but this is what comes to mind. And I think people, other people have already said something similar. You know, you can go to regular high school or you can do online high school. And now we've kind of had the experience of both with the pandemic, right? And there's a real difference. Like people said, like in regular high school, you're hanging out in the hallway in between class, you know, you might make a little connection with someone and, you know, while you're, waiting to get your, you know, food at the cafeteria, um, school is over and on the walk home, you know, you might, there's this sort of social emotional and there's sort of this soft skill development. And there's a lot that happens for good and for bad when you're in, in person in the high school setting. And you don't get that if you're online. And so I think there's just a lot of thought about the pluses and minuses of both, but how to create equity. That's what, that's what concerns me about it, right? We have students at, you know, in team trial that aren't allowed to go into the high school, right? So they're forced online. And it's a problem because they're not getting access to those things people in the public school get access to, that sort of soft experience. So I worry about that too with a hybrid notion of our legislature. And you know, a lot of what Tariq said, like that is my experience historically, is you can get a lot of work done being down there, right? In these soft ways, right? Running into a legislator, getting a coffee, and oh, putting in your two cents about you know, a little idea you had and, and the relationship building, and then you have that closer relationship and that, you know, staffer will respond to you more quickly, right? Or can you help me, you know, get some information about that? Oh, sure, I'll help you out, right? So I think we just need to be really thoughtful and about that as we move forward, because that ability to participate remotely is critical. I think it's, that's what I, my takeaway from the last couple of years is it is critical and it is a game changer. But we also think just trying to think about how to do that in a way that maintains that some sort of thoughtfulness about not creating two different experiences of lobbying, two different experiences of being legislative advocates, whether you're you know, a paid lobbyist or you're just a community member wanting to lobby your legislature, right? That, that there, there has to be some thought about that. I don't know that solutions, I have some ideas, I don't know the solutions, but I think that's a, that has to be really thoughtful. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Yeah, we'll get into possible solutions, and I'd love to hear ideas in just a moment. Misha, do you have anything you'd like to add? 
Yeah, just briefly, these thought, the comments that everyone's sharing are so thoughtful. And the only things I would add in are, um, one, just an observation around language access. So like, so appreciate in this webinar, Claudia being here and doing Spanish interpretation. And, you know, I was able to see in the legislative process in the virtual environment, a little bit more ease and facility around supporting access for people in um, speaking languages other than English. So that was a definite it plus, you know, also like just, you know, keeping folks safe, right? Recognizing like we've been in the middle of a, you know, really um, terrible pandemic. And for legislators, lobbyists, community advocates, um, individuals impacted by policy, just obviously the like, um, you know, it hasn't been stated, but I think is important just this idea that we're prioritizing kind of public health and um, keeping folks safe. Um, I do want to, I'm excited to get into like what else is needed because, you know, some of this has already been surfaced, but, you know, I think that um, this experience of the last two years for me helped kind of reinforce that virtual access on its own actually is not sufficient to really support um, inclusion of voices in the legislative process. And that's kind of like an obvious statement, but I think especially at the beginning of the 2021 legislative session, when I saw so many people being able to make their voices heard in remote testimony options, I was feeling really positive. Like this is like, this is going to really change things. And I think that my experience in the 2022 legislative session kind of reinforced for me that um, that that simply giving people like 30 minutes, I mean, 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes to like testify, um, that actually isn't like enough to change the process and policymaking. And so folks have surfaced some of those things already about kind of the two tiers of access in a hybrid situation, um, kind of who has the ability to build relationships, who doesn't, are voices really heard in terms of making changes in policy. Um, and I think, you know, some of the things, um, there's just like a lot more to be done and maintaining remote access for me is like a, a very, very bare minimum of what it really looks like to um, promote kind of a broad range of voices in the state policymaking process. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And, and all of your comments were fantastic. I'm just going to play a short clip from parent advocate Kara Bailey, and then we'll move on to the second question. Kara Bailey, and um, I have a 15-year-old son with autism. He um, has post-traumatic stress disorder from um, isolation and restraints in a school setting. And um, so that is why um, I started um, advocating for him, especially on a state level. Um, and I find it um, to be more helpful to have it remote um, as far as um, participating with the legislative sessions, because I can't leave my son. Um, there are no educational settings for him at this point. And so I am um, in charge of his education and I can't um, just leave and spend a day in Olympia, nor can I leave anytime. <laughs> okay. So now to our second question, what would make the legislative process more accessible and more equitable moving forward? And Carissa, once again, I'd like to start with you. Perfect. So one thing I would throw out there um, that I randomly remembered from Tariq, um, I actually, a week prior to the entire country shutting down, I was actually paging at the state capitol um, for the House of Representatives. So that one week they were touching on so many COVID things. And then the following week I went back to school. And then that Friday, I was like so excited for fast pitch and softball. And then my teachers looked at me halfway through the day and they were like, so we're all going home. We'll see you after spring break. And I was like, it is March. Spring break is not till April. Um, so that was like my first kind of experience in the legislature was that. And then it just, everything shut down. So following that, I didn't know how to get engaged. I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Like, my teachers were the ones that were actively showing me these things. And then I wasn't in school. So I'm just kind of sitting doing paperwork and like turning in paper assignments and wondering like, 
where do I go from here in advocating for what the students need? And then we switched to the virtual format and I want to say half my school at the time, it was only 300 kids K through 12, but about half those students did not have any internet access. So they were getting paper packets. And for the rest of that year, they were doing paper packets. And then the beginning of the following year, it was paper packets. And then they figured out hotspots and they were personally picking kids up and driving them to the library and finding ways to get those kids engaged. And um, so when it came time for me to be a part of LIAC and be involved in the legislator remotely, that was one of my big things was just that I didn't go on LIAC. I didn't join LIAC to change life for myself. I changed, I wanted to make change for the students that I saw struggling. And I knew that from what I had done prior that I had a strong enough voice to do that, but I didn't know how. So when everything switched to remote, I felt like it was a little bit more accessible for me. Now, the ways that we can make it more accessible is a tough one because I saw like firsthand what it was like for my school to try and get kids just to be able to join a 30 minute Zoom call to learn math. How do we get someone in a rural area access to join for 10 minutes to testify on a bill? Or how do we get them a computer to sit down and research the legislation? And, or how do we get them to the closest library to just use those computers? And I feel like it's just such a, a thing where it's like you want a solution, but you just don't know what the solution is. And it's one of those cases where I feel like it's always just going to end up being that you have to go to the source. And I feel like a lot of the time, at least in LIAC's work, um, I know Tariq mentioned our bill um, that we wrote with Federal Way about the mental health excuse absences. Um, we would not have heard from Federal Way ASB if it was not for everything being remote and them deciding to email us. I can tell you nobody in my school at least even knew what an email was and they only had their school email and we weren't checking that. Um, so I feel like to, to get a solution into making the legislator more accessible, it's looking at who we are trying to make it accessible for and asking them what they need and seeing how we as a community can support them because I feel like at the end of the day, as much as we would want to do something at the state level to make it accessible to everybody, I just don't see anything that would accurately be able to include everyone. And I feel like it's such a case by case thing. So I would just kind of throw that out there is that I always just think it's something where we've just got to go to the person and be like, how can we support you in getting you into this? And we at, at LIAC have been looking at how to make our organization more accessible and joining it or working with us. And I feel like these conversations are always just leading back to that. We need to go to the source and we need to speak to them. So I want to just want to put that out there. Uh, I think uh, digital equity is like really big. I mean, we just kind of what uh, Carissa was saying, she said some folks didn't know what the email was. So, you know, we just need to teach people how to use like a phone, use a computer. But I also think that they need to know that they can count on good internet. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's expensive or not. You know, if the service is like very slow, especially like outside the city and rural areas, that's still like a barrier for folks. And so this that digi digital equity piece, I think is like real big to make sure that, um, you know, constituents can like participate uh, in the legislative process. And then also, uh, you know, hope with the hope, uh, thinking about hybrid, you, you know, there was that. Uh, uh, bill, uh, Senate Bill 5793, stipends for low income or under, underrepresented community members um, for, on uh, commissions and school boards and other similar groups. I hope, and, you know, with if it does go like hybrid, hopefully, like that bill will help like folks, uh, you know, transportation or, you know, gas, you know, things like that. If it is like hyper safely hybrid, uh, you know, they can come down to like Olympia to like still like, like participate in the process. But uh, also this, if it, you know, it is hybrid, uh, it's not my lane, but hopefully that folks, because we're still in this pandemic, uh, it's not over with. Hopefully, you know, if we do do a hybrid, you know, maybe we can, you know, wear, you know, face masks, check uh, vax cars or check, you know, you know, the test within three days. So just still making sure that it is like still like safely, uh, if we do go back to like a hybrid model, but still, 
just thinking about like the digital equity piece as well. So I want to just piggyback on what's been said about technology and what we have found in Northeast Spokane is that um, texting and using phones, um, more people have phones with data than they do wireless and computers and more people use phone numbers than they do use emails. And that also applies to the language equity and I appreciate Misha calling that out, we have the highest diversity of home languages in Northeast as well. So um, really where I see or, uh, community organizations and statewide nonprofits doubling down to make sure that uh, constituents are connected to issues that they care about is um, really having some organized way for people to understand what organization has policy keepers who will message out those things very pertinent and important to them. So for example, LEV is a great listserv to be on if you care about education equity, and I would say stand as well, and you can get information from them. And then they just, they just pull out a few top bills or funding issues, and then they, they make it so easy to push a button and then magically your legislators are emailed with your um, opinion, either that form letter is going through or you can modify it. And I will say that since COVID, our legislators are much more responsive to those form letters. And the ones that I participate in, um, I get personal emails back from legislators, even saying things like, hey, I might vote for that this year, you know, from, from a legislator that typically wouldn't vote for a funding issue in education. And so I, I think that really connecting people, what is it that you care about? Is it child welfare? Is it early learning? Is it equity in education? Is it higher ed funding? Um, is it um, access for students with disabilities and inclusion? Like, what is it? And then somehow if these statewide organizations and community organizations can create that information stream that is accessible through a phone so that you can stay up to date, be engaged, and those few messages, a good example is the chart WA charters, you know, because there's just a few charters. So you know, and they publish the information, click this link to sign in a pro or con on this bill. It's so easy that someone with um, a language, a, a different home language, or someone that doesn't have access to a computer, or someone that doesn't have the availability to testify can still be involved. And I see all of that being so much more powerful and heard. There's so much more space for that type of input now than there was when they could just depend on that person that was walking them from their office to the coffee shop. You know, well, I think there's a lot that community organizations can be doing to make the process more approachable and accessible for our constituents, the folks that we are trying to get involved. I think we still need to hold legislators feet to the fire. Um, there are two big things that come to mind for me. Um, the first is really trying to plan everything with equity and inclusion in mind. And, and if we truly do that, we look at the huge amount of bureaucracy that you have to navigate in this system to be able to actually participate. We ask your legislators to reduce that. Um, you know, what I'm thinking about signing in for a bill hearing not only do I need to understand how to get to the sign-in page and how to navigate that page, I also have to understand how to access the agendas and what all of that means to be able to figure out where I need to sign in. That is just too much. I mean, I have two computer screens. I have to have both of them open to be doing all of that at once to make sure I'm not making a mistake. That's just too much. It shouldn't be that complicated. There are a lot of small things that we can be doing, the legislators can be doing, the folks who are managing the website can be doing to make it easier. Um, instead of having to go through either the House or the Senate tabs, what if there was just a button on the homepage that said, this is where you sign in for testimony? Boom, right here, that's it, right? Such a small thing. Um, I also think the other thing we really need to ask from our legislators 
is to fully fund TVW for the services that they're providing as well. From what I understand, TVW is funded at a third of what it actually costs for them to provide support to the legislature. That's just not working. TVW is, in this COVID time, while we're all virtual, is the one way of actually knowing what's going on in the legislative process. They're absolutely critical. We need to treat them that they are, treat them like they are critical, which means giving them the funding that they need to bring back things like um, full-time Spanish interpretation for hearings, having ASL interpreters for hearings, making sure that we've got accurate captioning for hearings. Um, I understand that before the recession, there was full-time Spanish interpretation for that TBW was providing, and that has, you know, a service that was cut and not built back up. And so I, I think in the interim, what we can be doing to support our constituents is really, really important. And we have to be doing all of those things to make it easy to engage in one or two clicks. But we also need to be looking at our legislators and asking them and holding them accountable to the transparent government we're supposed to be having, to making sure that they are uh, demonstrating that they understand that having everyone participate in democracy is actually how we make the system stronger and actually how we develop better policies. So those are two things that really come to mind. I love I, that. I just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Misha. Go ahead. I just love that list, Daria, and I wanted to add to it because um, I do think that um, those are really, really important suggestions. And I feel like um, I want to add like two dynamics to one is like the time constraints and the rushedness of the legislative session and the, the features of having like particularly the 60 day legislative session um, and how that leads to like really running over community input. Um, and that's a system that constrains legislators as well. But I think we have to name like the way that that, that kind of structure is actually um, no amount of like virtual testimony is going to solve that. Um, the other thing is like there's just some um, like kind of egregious bad behavior in terms of like how um, input is incorporated. And so um, that's related to the time constraints. And I just want to like name a couple of things that I saw during the 60 day legislative session. You know, one, we work on the state budget. You know, the, the legislative proposals for the state budgets are hundreds of pages long. They were released at 9 a.m. and noon, and there was a public hearing at 3 p.m. the same day. It doesn't matter if folks are able to participate in person or remote um, if you haven't had time to actually look at the proposal. And there's no way you could say with like a straight face that that was giving any meaningful opportunity for public input. Um, similarly, you know, oftentimes legislative committees so packed with bills that there was a feeling of rushed all through the hearing. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about Jennifer, I know you were set to testify at a hearing on a guaranteed basic income proposal this year, and it was better that folks were able to be remote. Um, at least they weren't hadn't driven to Olympia, I suppose, but went through the entire hearing and in the final like five minutes said, oh, we're out of time, we're not going to have this hearing. Um, or I think in that same hearing, someone testifying and speaking to, you know, the, the asthma impacts of COVID and being kind of told like, you need to wrap up, you need to wrap up. And um, I just think there's some of those things that there should be like, almost like a... Um, like a zero tolerance for um, that if we are really going to have a hearing and we're going to hear uh, folks provide um, and share their experiences that like that um, that it's really going to be listened to and folks are going to be given time and that their time is going to be respected. Um, so just kind of like adding that, I guess, to the list as well. Misha, that you you said almost exactly what I wanted to add. One thing I wanted to add was the sense of time. And uh, if you're going to expand access, which you should, to people participating in the process, then the process needs to expand in its time in order for that to be meaningful. And, and I couldn't agree more that there is no way for meaningful participation in really complex, I mean, there's hundreds of bills, not to mention that hundreds of pages of budget. Um, and to really hear from all different sides of an issue and to open it up to say, we wanna hear from all areas of the state and then to still have these 
four bills in an hour and a half, and everyone's going to get you know 30 minutes, 30 seconds to a minute to say something about it, and then yeah, and then believe that that is a meaningful contribution to you know the decision about what should happen with that bill. Um, and and that sort of gets back to sort of the two tier, which is on most of the bills I testified on, I've been I had had conversations even before the session started, right? Because I was in the right rooms, in the right places, right? And I'm hopefully, you know, our organization and I'm sure all the others here are trying to make sure other people can get into those rooms, right? But that's just the, the perpetual question about how to make sure there's not a multi-tiered sort of access point. Um, and, uh, and Daria said it more eloquently than I did, this sort of easy access to that, the, the, the online, you know, programming of uh, Washington State because finding who's on the committee. You know, you know, I was gonna add like one of the benefits also was to be able to write your testimony, right? Instead of speak, but writing the testimony means you have to go and find the email addresses of all of the, to, to send it to the committee, right? Like it, it's very tedious, quite frankly. And I'm not sure why it's not um, easier for people to be able to send, you know, if a committee had a hearing and then 200 people to testify and they can't hear from them all, but then they end it and say, you can always submit written testimony. There should be a really easy way to do that to the committee, right? Like, because, uh, and, and it's baffling that there's not. And the last thing I just wanted to add, you know, I, I really appreciate the funding for TBW, but also starting with Carissa's most, you know, eloquent point and insightful point about how community groups can try to help make sure access for community, right? That that really, what do you need and what can we do to support that? I mean, quite frankly, there needs to be funding for that. I mean, none of these community groups here on this panel can do that access that bridging for free. So there's layers of what it means to financially support access. And so I think that's another question around how to improve access. Um, if the state legislature itself isn't going to set up the infrastructure to make it you know, infinitely accessible to all the people in the state, if there's gonna be a reliance on communities to organize to try to create that support, I think democracy sort of requires some financial commitment to that. Um, so there may be a need to, you know, suggest that that kind of funding for that kind of support that Lab does, that many of the organizations here do, because, um, you know, we're relying on the community to fund us, to give community access to the legislature. So I don't know if the legislature wants access, you know, people to have access, maybe there needs to be a commitment from them. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Jasmine, Jennifer, anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, I was just going to add, I definitely agree, Karen, um, I, based on our experience, uh, the TVW was really helpful, um, accessing the information, hearing the conversations in real time, it really helped us with our mobilization, or like weekly, how to plan, how we plan, how to uh, what what's going on? How can we increase more um, encouraging constituents, providers, parents to reach out to the legislators? So that has been. Uh, I think I would just like to add to that, like especially with our busy lives, it was it was easier to like just hop in to listen and be part of that. Um, but it could definitely improve. Um, the access language access uh, definitely like translation and across the state I'm sure there's uh, you know there's more languages than other than English and I think um, continue to fund that um, and also Terry um, mentioned about the SB 5793 um, which has been a great success we have a lot of um, advocates that want to be part of and but it's always a question of like you know uh, even though remotely they still have to dedicate that time um, away from their family or away from their work and I think that's just um, provide an equitable process for anybody who wants to join and be compensated uh, and in fact, somebody was saying it's, it's not really a compensation because you have to give up your time, whether it's your personal time or work time. Um, it's it's but at least there is there is a way and an opportunity for everyone to be able to be part or be heard of. So I think those are just the two that I want to add. 
Yeah, just just going off of what everyone was saying, I appreciate you know all of your 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 aspects um, and experiences. I think it's you know it's important when we talk about um, you know stipends for low income and people with lived experiences because there are times when we're testifying or telling our story and it and it is a good way to compensate us for having to um, to speak about some of those those most difficult times. Um, I've spoken a lot about being um, you know homeless and dealing with childhood poverty and you know to be able to to speak out and and I do those things because I know that's going to create some awareness and some change. Um, you know, now having a child who has a disability, I've I've come across many issues within the education system, and I'm finding that my next um, advocacy is going to have to be in special education um, because during this time of virtual, you know, my son has had many difficulties. Um, and it's and it's just been more more imperative that I be able to explain that to my legislators either here in my local district um, or speak to our Congress or um, senators. But you know, going forward, you know, as terms of as accessibility and equity being equitable access, um, like many spoke about the digital access. You know, there's just, there's many of us who, you know, internet is really expensive. Um, it's been even harder during this time with COVID. Uh, I, I have to pay $100 a month for internet. Um, a lot of the way these companies design their internet programs, um, they claim that there's some accessibility for low income, but there's many, there's, it's, there's a lot of hoops to get to that. Um, and having having the ability to be able to use a telephone and to use the internet is not always accessible for many from many people out on the reservations, uh, many people out in the rural parts, um, and they're just very much disconnected. They're disconnected from the community and from this legislative process. And if it wasn't for these other nonprofit organizations like Washington Low Income Housing Alliance and Community Change and the YWCA Pathways for Women, I actually would not even have any knowledge of how to testify either in person or virtually. Uh, this isn't something that's part of our education system. We don't teach our children, you know, you can use your voice. This is how you can use your voice and change policies and laws, you know, to advocate for yourself. And I wonder why that isn't incorporated into our education. You know, why, why aren't we teaching our young people you know, this is what you can do to create change and impact. Um, and this is how you can do it. Well, you know, we talk about all these aspects of getting our kids ready to be leaders um, and people in our community, but having them understand how this democracy works, how to be able to better advocate for, for changes in their communities, I think is important and something that I would like to see on an education level. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you all for your comments on how to make the system more equitable moving forward. I'd like to give you an opportunity for last words. I know we're at time right now, so if any of you had a hard stop at 1.30, uh, feel free to just raise your hand real quick, and if there's something you want to say, um, Karen, <laughs> just like that, go ahead. Any, any last words from you? No, I, I appreciate the panelists. I think there's been so much wisdom to your I've learned so much, so thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, any other last words, Carissa? I'll have you go last because obviously your student perspective is is really important. But uh, Jenna, yes, I'll I'll briefly jump in um, to the sense of time and to the relationship building pieces that we've discussed today. Um, let's not forget that letters of of support, letters around an issue that have multiple signatures on them, multiple community partners, multiple stakeholders are really heard and there's more time to lay out um, the story and to lay out community support for whatever the issue might be. We at the community center got $700,000 for a new behavioral health clinic in both the Senate and the house budget this year in a supplemental year, uh, largely through letters of support from our community. 
um, just saying, you know, four to six months from intake to being seen if you're a suicidal teen is not acceptable. And so um, even though that happened outside of the hearing, uh, it's, a, it's a budget issue, we were still effective. So remember that there's alternate ways to make sure that the whole story is heard, even if you're only limited to that 30 seconds or a minute in testimony. Yeah, thank you. And Amisha had to drop off. Karen, uh, I know you have to drop off too, so thanks for that. Uh, any other last words? Daria, Jennifer, Jasmine, Tariq? And I know Carissa will get to you. Uh, yeah, this is Daria. I will add one more thing that I forgot to bring up earlier, which is that I think not only has remote testimony been helpful in a lot of ways to engage more advocates, but it's also made the process more approachable. Um, the idea of having folks go down to Olympia, you know, sit in front of a bunch of people in suits and a panel of maybe 10, 15 legislators who are all there to um, hear about possibly the worst moment of your life is really intimidating. It's really, really intimidating. And it is a horrific power imbalance there. And I think that this has shifted it in some small ways. Obviously, you're still going to see all the people in the Zoom room, but it is a very different experience to be in your home, in the comfort of your own home. If you've got your tea or your water, another thing that you can't do when you're in Olympia at a hearing room, right? Um, and you're able to, you got, you know, be as comfortable as you can be in whatever your space is. I think that that can't be um, understated enough how much that has also impacted people's willingness to participate in this process. Um, but I guess I would just end with saying thank you to everyone, all the work that you're doing to support folks in getting involved and making people's voices heard and holding the legislators feet to the fire. I think this conversation makes it really, really clear if it wasn't already that we still have so much work to do but we've got a great foothold. And I think that this is a fabulous opportunity for us to keep pushing, to try and make that change. So thank you, Eric, for having me. Oh, thank you, Daria. Uh, Jennifer, Jasmine, Tariq. Just, I wanted to extend my most humble appreciation for you all and all that you do in the communities. And I just look forward to working with you, you know, going forward. Great, thank you. Before uh, I, I go on to someone else, I wanna play uh, just a, a quick final thought from our parent advocate, Carissa uh, Bailey, I mean, uh, Kara Bailey, sorry, Carissa, uh, who wasn't able to be live on the panel. I would just like to say that Washington as a whole has a lot of work to do when it comes to education. Um, my son, was harmed in an educational setting. Um, he will probably won't be able to access um, public school systems again, at least in person, um, because of what occurred uh, with the isolation and restraints. Um, we can't drive by a school. Uh, we can't talk about school. Um, that is how much it impacted him and our family. Um, we can't talk about his brother going to school. So, um, it, Things need to improve. Um, I'm pulling public records pretty consistently, and I'm still seeing the same trends with isolation and restraints. Thank you. Okay, Jasmine, Tariq. I just wanna say thank you so much for having me here and um, being in this great panel. Thank you. Yeah. I'm thankful for being here. Just want to thank everybody, uh, especially you, Eric, uh, for this awesome panel today. All right, thank you. And uh, Carissa, as a student, you do have the last word. I'll just end us off by just saying that uh, students and the, the people who are in your middle and elementary and high school and preschools are the future. And we are going to be the ones that are sitting in those senator and representative seats here in a couple of years. So. I would just always just say that, make sure you're encouraging the youth around you, no matter what, what they look like or who they love or anything like that, to be involved and to speak on their passions and to be engaged and to just remember that they are the future and that everything that is happening now is gonna impact them, whether it impacts them now or later, and that they need to be looking out for it. Well, thank you, Carissa, Kara, Daria, 
Jasmine, Jenna, Jennifer, Karen, Misha, and Tariq. And thanks to all of you for participating and leaving comments in the chat and, and being part of our conversation. Our next webinar will take place on Thursday. This is next Thursday, April 7th at 1230 PM. David Lewis, the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Seattle Public Schools and a consultant to districts across Washington State and beyond, will explain why this school year is so challenging for students, parents, and educators, and provide strategies to better support students moving forward. Students from across Washington State will share feedback and stories from the classroom. Spanish interpretation and closed captioning in English will be available. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, then lunchtime webinars. I'll also share the webinar information in the follow-up email that will arrive in your inbox in about 24 hours. Thank you again for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share the recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work or join our listserv, please visit our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we will fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Carissa, Kara, Daria, Jasmine, Jenna, Jennifer, Karen, Misha, and Tariq, thank you again for joining us and for everything you do for Washington students and families. I hope you have a great rest of your week.